I can't hear anything. Where is, I don't have the camera on, I guess. I guess I don't want the camera. Angela, can you hear me? I see you're on mute now. Yes, yes I can. Okay, we haven't started yet, so. No worries. You want to sit at the table? I'm fine. We'll just go in the other room. All right, everyone, it's five o'clock. Uh, this is Tim Parker, your NA Alaska president. We're going to wait about another minute or two. We have 37 people have managed to find their way into the room so far. That's fantastic. We're expecting potentially as many as 96. And uh, so we're hoping, hoping to fill up the room here really soon. People are probably getting through the login process and getting accepted. So we'll start in about a minute. Thanks for being here on time. Now say it. Now say it. Hello, Tim Parker and Glenn. This is Jeff Harris. Hey, Jeff, we miss you. <laughs> I miss you guys too. Glad you're getting better, Jeff. Okay, as we're getting started here, it's about 5.01, and uh, we are excited to be uh, ready to go on this process. Um, my name is Tim Parker. I'm your NA Alaska president, and uh, I hope you're somewhat familiar with Zoom. Uh, Zoom has uh, lots of different capabilities in it, and uh, one of them is uh, if you're running the meeting, you get to mute people. And so I think uh, some of our staff members, uh, Zach Mannix is the host and he is helping out by keeping making sure everyone's muted. And uh, when you wanna speak, one of the fun things about Zoom, as you probably already know, is you can do this little raise hand function, which is lots of fun. So um, if you would like to uh, jump into the conversation and you have a question, there'll be lots of time for questions at the end, but, uh, using the raise hand function is a good way to get my attention. If you do want to ask a question in the chat and uh, and and or say something that might be helpful to others in the group, chat's a great place to park something like that. Um, I can't guarantee that I'll be able to read everything in chat as we go, but someone on the staff, someone on our any Alaska staff who's with us tonight will we'll make sure that they are keeping track of that. And we'll give you a uh, email also for questions if you want to email in some questions in a little bit um you don't have to have them hey, all tim moment yes i think we hear something in the background behind you a female voice okay hold on just one second I could do a little song and dance for everybody, but I don't think you'd want to hear me sing. So we'll just wait for Tim to get back. Uh, there he is. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, anyway, I, yeah, this is great. I'm so glad that all of you are able to join us here today. Uh, my name's Tim Parker. I'm your NA Alaska president, and we have a couple other presenters coming up here. I'm going to go ahead and share screen and give you uh, a look at the initial PowerPoint and the agenda, uh, which are right up here go hopefully that looks good for you so this is the retirement roadshow financial basics and if you've managed to get in here it means you probably are a member of NEA Alaska we hope that that's the case and that you're probably in one of the initial tiers either tier three TERS or tier four PERS uh, if you're not one of those that's okay too you'll probably get some information that you you probably want to have also but uh, those are kind of some of the important pieces that uh, you need to know right at the beginning. So here's our agenda for today. Um, and like the introduction says, my name's Tim Parker. 
after I'm done, I'm going to go on for about 10 minutes, and then I'm going to uh, then I'm going to bring in Teresa Munch. She's uh, with member NEA member benefits, and she's going to give you an overview of some of the services that we offer through that uh, that process. And then uh, she's going to talk to you about selecting a financial advisor. Also, uh, there's uh, we have a we have Kurt Witzleben with us. He's from Anchorage, and he's a financial uh, advisor, and he's going to talk for a little bit. And then we're going to end with Segway Grant, your NEA Alaska Vice President, and she's going to go over how to, how to use Empower, some of the basics of that. And if you're in Tier 3 TERS or Tier 4 PERS, uh, you should be knowing how to use Empower. But we'll give you a little overview of that. Then we're going to stop for questions and answers and uh, do the best we can to try to meet what you need as far as that's concerned. So I get to do a little bit of the introduction, and uh, I'm an English teacher from Fairbanks when I'm not doing this job. That's what I'll be doing in August when, uh, when this turns over and Tom Claymeyer becomes your NA Alaska president. Um, and so I'm, I got hired way back in 1997, so that means that I'm part of TERS 2, uh, Teacher Retirement System 2. So I'm not in the new retirement system. Um, but every educator in Alaska is in one of them. Uh, if you were hired a long time ago in, as a teacher, you could be a TERS 1. There aren't many of those left. Uh, there's lots of TERS 2, but the majority of teachers in Alaska are in TERS 3. And that's the three tiers for the TERS side. On the PERS side, which is the public employee side of things, uh, there's public employees. There's one, two, and three. Those are all ones that were hired before 2006. And then the one that uh, we're going to focus on today is PERS 4, and that's anyone hired after, after 2006 in the public employees retirement system. And that includes our support staff members and, uh, and people in other things, people in the public safety realm and people that do other jobs like that. So all of you hopefully know which one you're in, although, you know, if you're really new, it, you're, you're, you might not have a lot of details about it. But uh, if you're a teacher and you were hired after 2006, you're in TERS 3. And if you're, a, if you're a support staff member and you're hired after 2006, you're in PERS 4. PERS 4 gets a little complicated because there's some wrinkles to it. And uh, sometimes you have to ask a few more questions and we got to find out what uh, district you work for to get some more details about exactly what benefits you qualify for. One thing that's clear for all of us though, is that we don't have social security. Tim, you froze on us right after you said Social Security. I was even thinking about being uh, an educator. For the PERS system, the opt-out happened in 1979. And so that, uh, that's been a little more recent, but probably before anyone here started their careers. Um, it, after every, anyone hired after 2006 falls in, uh, well, we did a switch. We went from defined benefit, which is what uh, a general term for the types of benefits that you were getting prior to 2006. If you were hired on July 2006 or after that date, you have what's called a defined contribution. And a defined contribution really isn't as secure as a defined benefit. Uh, the number, the amount put in for you into an account changed slightly. And, uh, the, and what really changed is the way that that money is actually invested and, and taken care of. So for TERS 3 employees, uh, you can see the numbers there, 8% and 7%. Those are the two streams of money that are going into your Empower accounts. And for PERS employees, uh, it's 8 and 5%. And then it gets down to some wrinkles that I put down here in the uh, uh, down below, which kind of depends on which employer you have, whether you have uh, uh, SBS, or um, some of actually, some of our PERS people actually have social security. So it gets a little confusing in the PERS side and we have to be more specific with that. But for TERS, and that's more than half of our teachers in Alaska, we have about 8,000 teachers in Alaska and more than half are in TERS 3. It's pretty straightforward. Um, so the, another question that I hear a lot when I'm talking to people about this is, do, do I have a pension? And for TERS 1 and 2 and PERS 1, 2, 3, the answer is yes, you have a pension. By any definition of the word pension, you have one. But for TERS 3 and PERS 4, the ones that are in defined contribution, I think the answer is no. Um, and I defined what the two things were here. The defined benefit plan uh, plans, they are clearly your pensions because they continue as long as you are living. So you can't run out of money. If you live to be 115 years old, you will still be getting your, your check if you're a retired, ter, retired uh, person with a defined benefit. That'd be TERS 1, 2 or PERS 1, 2, 3. 
that if you're hired after 2006, you have what's known as a defined contribution. It's really not a pension. It's a lot more like a 401k account and you have to manage it very carefully or it may run out during your retirement. And uh, Social Security, I put in italics down at the bottom because in some ways, Social Security can act very similar to a pension. Most, uh, most financial people would say, oh, it's not a pension. Well, it has one of the aspects we like about pensions. It doesn't run out. Uh, if you can live to be 115, you get, uh, you, you're still gonna be getting a monthly check. Um, and if that's one of the things you're interested in, and that's, what it, that's a big part of being a pension, it has that particular aspect as part of it. Uh, next slide. So what is any Alaska doing? So this has been a top issue for you, for our association for a long time. And we really are a collective association, more than 12,000 educators around the state. We care about education. We think about it every day. We want to make sure that it's happening right for the students in our schools, even when we're in this strange environment of doing distance learning. Um, but th this issue, the idea of what happened to our retirement in 2006, that's been right at the top ever since 2006. Um, the efforts right now in, the, in most recent times are being led by our, our SOAR committee, the Save Our Alaska Retirement Committee. It's chaired by Segway Grant, who you're gonna to get to hear from in a little bit. Uh, she's our vice president, and there's a, she has about a dozen others who are with her on that team. And I would divide our area of work as far as any Alaska is concerned into three different spots. One, and that's sort of the obvious one that I think right from 2006 we were working hard on, and that's to persuade the legislature to pass a better bill. We've tried, we've been putting new, we've been putting uh, ideas in front of them year after year after year. At times we've been able to convince maybe one of the two, uh, uh, either the Senate or the House to pass that particular legislation. We've even had a governor at times who would probably have signed that piece of legislation if it had reached their desk. We have yet to get all three and uh, it, it remains a challenge, but it's not one that we're gonna give up on. And there are lots of different ways we can fix the current retirement system. There's not just one option. Um, obviously, returning to a defined benefit would work, but we have some other options that we've been talking about and uh, we're considering. So that's something you should continue to keep an eye on and it help if you can talk to your own legislator about it, that's always an option. The other uh, two areas, one of the other areas is educate our TERS 3 and PERS 4 members about how to save for retirement. That's really what this particular um, uh, Finance, this little forum that we're doing, the Retirement Roadshow tonight, is really focused on. We want to make sure you have the best information about how to save for your own retirement if you're in the defined contribution area, and we want, it, we want you to be successful. And there is a chance to be successful. It's not completely hopeless. It just takes a lot of effort on your part and a lot of management on your part, and a pretty good stock market, which hasn't happened in the last month or so. And that's another reason why I think we wanted to have this, uh, we went ahead with this call, even though we're doing this distance delivery and everyone is uh, social distancing and spending a lot of time in their homes. Um, the third area that we uh, work that we've been working on is we're trying to help individual school districts return to social security if the members want to. Now, no, none of the teacher units have done this and uh, just some of the PERS uh, support staff units have returned to social or have social security and they, um, but it is possible and it does, and there is a process and it can be done. Um, so I just wanna make sure you know that's an option that's out there. Uh, the, the, as an organization, our delegate assembly uh, passed a motion that we would make sure we would help any district that wanted to move that way. So if you or members in your district feel like you wanna potentially pursue that, we're ready to help you help you consider that potential option. Um, it, it takes some work, it takes a, your, your school board has to has to vote on it and uh, then members it depends on how you do it uh, your members could potentially get to vote on getting in if they want to um, I just wanted to end with this last slide for me my portion of this your any Alaska SOAR committee I wanted to make sure you knew who they were they're divided up by region around the state and you can kind of see this so segues your your chair and uh, she happens to live in Bethel which is fantastic she works for LKNEA or LK <laughs> Laura Cuskerquim Mike Beer is in Sitka Danielle Specks in Kodiak Alyssa Fabian's in Seward Corey Shepherd's in Kotzebue Chris Benchop is in Fairbanks Jacob Barra in Anchorage Jackie Cunningham and Matsu Bob Williams is a retired uh, member. He used to teach at Colony High School. He's a former teacher of the year for the state. And uh, then we have a couple statewide members, uh, Matt Hunter from Sitka, Tom Claymeyer from Anchorage, and Nate Freeman from Lower Cusquim have all been really, really helpful 
to this particular committee. And they're supported by a couple staff members who are on this call tonight. And you can, you can uh, I put their emails up there in case you wanted to get a hold of them. And if you have any questions and you, you want to get an email response in the future, direct it either to Glenn Buffia, he's our executive director, or to Matt Moser. And there's their emails for both of them. And they're, they're both really fantastic staff members who are super helpful. All right, so I get to stop sharing my screen. And I'm going to introduce our next speaker on this one, which is going to be Teresa Munch. Teresa has worked with us for lots of years. She's been with NE Alaska, uh, which she's not an NE Alaska employee, but she works for NEA member benefits. And she's been to Alaska dozens of times. I'm sure it's probably even more than that. Um, she works for the NEA Member Benefits Corporation, and that, and that corporation, it's a not-for-profit, wholly-owned subsidiary of NEA. And since we're all NEA members, she works for us. So she's our employee, so we're happy to have her here. Um, the purpose of Member Benefits is to connect NEA members with the treasure trove of great options and potential ways to save money. And she's going to tell you about some of those, and then she's going to talk to you about how to choose, potentially, how to choose a financial advisor if that's something that you want to do and that's something that you think will help you save more for your potential retirement. And then she's going to introduce, uh, well, she's going to throw it back to me and I'll introduce you to our financial advisor we've invited on to talk to you tonight. So without, without further ado, Teresa, take it away. Thank you, Tim. And thank you all for being on the call with us tonight. Um, it means a lot in these crazy times that, um, I think each of us is trying to find little ways in which we feel like we're a little bit more in control. And maybe this is one of the things that you'll feel really good about after tonight, that you've learned a little something, you've taken control of something that you can actually um, take a little bit of control of right now. So um, kudos to you. I think the number one reason most of our members don't get around to planning for or taking care of their retirement as well as many other things is simply procrastination. We never put ourselves first. We procrastinate those decisions that are really hard decisions. And um, again, I think any Alaska has taken a big step forward here by providing you guys some education around what that looks like and trying to give you some resources um, to keep you moving in the right direction. So congratulations on no longer procrastinating and for um, taking a little bit of control here. You heard Tim say um, a few things and I'm going to reiterate them. And that is, first of all, this whole retirement planning journey that you're on is a very confusing one. State retirement systems are not always easy to understand. You know, we saw a, a message come up in our chat button about somebody who had worked in another state and is now working in Alaska. Each and every one of you has a very unique situation um, that would cause the decisions that you make about your, retiring, your retirement planning to be different than the person who teaches in the classroom right next door to you, or even your best friend, or somebody who you think has a very similar lifestyle, age, and choices. And all. You're going to have very unique um, retirement planning processes and journeys and decisions um, that you have to make. So because of our confusion, because of how personalized it is, the union wants to give you as much information and resource as possible. So here's what we have. Um, this always happens to me. I can never get the buttons to click forward right away. Sorry, I'm trying to move my screens forward. Let me go like this. This, enter, there we go. Sorry about that. So here's what we have. We've got a website, neamb.com backslash start. If each and every one of you goes to that website, creates an account or signs in. So if you've been to our website before, you just sign in. Um, if you haven't, you're gonna create an account with us because this is member only information and we wanna keep it that way. So we have a membership verification process built into the website. Once you get there, you will see all kinds of information about the programs and services we have. And yeah, you know, on another day at another time, um, you and I can chat about travel benefits and about um, buying cars and um, online discounts and all kinds of fun stuff. But tonight, we're going to stay pretty focused on your financial matters. I guess with that said, I would encourage you to always go back to this website, neamb.com, and take a look at some of the other items that are there. But tonight, what we want you to do is scroll down to the bottom of that page and you'll start to see information about your NEA retirement program. And I, can't, I have to take a minute here to point out the fact that this is a program that we offer our members, which is very different than what you see sometimes in your 
school lounges or at your new teacher orientation days, oftentimes what you see there is somebody selling a 403B plan, period. It's not a program, it's not support, it is an opportunity for you to purchase a product from somebody. Now, back to what I said a few minutes ago, there are some of you on the call tonight that that's all you need right now. You just need to find a place to start socking some money away in a 403B and that's fine, that might be all you need. But what our members told us is that they wanted something different. What they wanted was a program from start to finish. So kind of that cradle to grave mentality whether you're early in your career or you're late in your career, you're somewhere in between, you're already in retirement, whatever sort of support and service you need, you're going to find that within the NEA retirement program. And so I would encourage you to check that program out online. In addition to um, checking that program out, why does this do this? Um, we also have online um, a bunch of resources. So there's, uh, there's a few of you on this call tonight with 44 people that are already logged into the call. I would imagine that there's four or five of you who think, you know what, I can do this on my own. I just need a few little tips and help and support. Well, we offer that. What we have on the website once you get in is a bunch of information that you can get access to, whether it's a five minute checkup, which is one of the tools we have, or it's a more in-depth look at where you are um, it brings in, that's the retirement income calculator. That's going to take you a while to get through that calculator. It's actually going to pull in the state of Alaska's retirement system that you're a member of, and it's going to add that information into the analysis that it spits back out for you. So along with uh, tools, there's also videos, there's uh, frequently asked questions, and there's a whole bunch of other educational resources that you can have at your fingertips as an NA Alaska member to help you start to understand and take control of your retirement planning. Most folks, and I'll just be uh, fairly blunt here, but what we have learned over the years is that most of our members, once they get into here, get into the website, start looking at things, um, they find themselves having questions and concerns and wanting some help. And so the next question that I've been, help, been asked to uh, try to answer tonight is, so what does that look like? So I know that many of you have lots of options at your school districts, different um, vendors, different products that you can actually stick money into um, in a 403B account. You probably see, some of you see several different representatives come and go through your school districts, um, kind of schlepping their wares to a certain degree. Um, those of you that are with Anchorage, you don't have that. Uh, you have one program, you have one choice, and that's a very different scenario than most of our members across the state of Alaska. So what all of you have asked me, whenever I show up at DA or whenever I'm in the state working with your staff or with your leaders, what folks ask me often is, why would I work with a financial advisor or how do I find a financial advisor to help me make these decisions? So I just wanted to make this real clear. Not everybody has to do this. We have an article on the website. I put the link up there at the top of the web of the PowerPoint slide. So you'll have that to click on later if we send the slides out. But I just highlighted out of that article why somebody would work with a financial advisor. Now again, not everyone's gonna do this, but for the most part, people who work with financial professionals tend to feel more confident in their financial future. And I, I hope I don't offend anyone by saying this, but I happen to uh, sleep in my own bed at night with a guy who is a financial advisor. He could give me advice, or he could give us advice on our money. Truth of the matter is, we hire someone else to do that for us because financial advisors have different qualifications, different relationships with my money than what my husband and I have. So to me personally, it's very important to have that person on my team helping me make those decisions who's not so attached to my money. But here's some of the reasons why you might consider working with a financial advisor. If you decide that that's something you would you want to consider, you want to look into doing, the next part of the question is always, how do I choose the right one? Um, and I'll say there isn't just one that's the right one. There isn't just one that's the best one. There are probably, and we tried to look this number up in preparation for this webinar and we couldn't find it. There are probably hundreds and hundreds of folks who can sell you a 403B in the state of Alaska. Lots of folks carry the right license to do that. 
there is a difference in who those people are. I used to tell folks, the number one thing I would ask, is this the guy or gal who I would feel comfortable going to have a cup of coffee with every six months or so and having a conversation about my very personal financial life? If you can answer that question, yes, that's a good place to start. Um, the other question you might wanna ask yourself is, is this individual an independent financial advisor or are they what I refer to, and I'm sure there's a, a broader or more appropriate name for them, but I call them captive agent type representative. So there's two pots of folks who sell our members on, um, across the country, not just in Alaska, sell our members 403B plans, help them get set up for retirement. Some of them are captive agents, meaning they work for a company and their job is to represent that company's programs and products and try to get people into those programs and products. Then there's another group that's called independent financial advisors. And those independent folks aren't beholden to any one company. In fact, they can sell and place business and do anything that our members might need them to do on their behalf. And that became very important to us at the national level because that's what our members told us they wanted. They wanted somebody who could do full financial planning and provide for them a, an unencumbered advice as to where they should go with their investments and their money. So that's where we developed this uh, model where we have NEA retirement specialists appointed. They're independent financial advisors so they can they can run the gamut of financial planning and programs and services and what they can help you get involved with. In addition to that, we're going to look for things like 10 plus years of the right experience, a clean record. So 10 years of the right experience. I'm going to go back to that a second. Sorry. I'm talking about 10 years of working with people who work in public education. I mean, that's a, that's a really good question to ask whoever you're interviewing to perhaps be your financial advisor. Do you work with other folks like me? Or do you work with really rich people? And is wealth management really what you're all about? I'm just a regular old person here with a little bit of money and I want to be able to live comfortably in retirement. Are you used to working with people like me? Um, second of all, there is a whole bunch of regulation in this industry. Thank goodness. These folks are highly regulated and it's pretty easy to find out whether or not they've had any um, complaints filed against them or any concerns with any of those agencies. I would, I would check that out also. I would ask them and then I would look into their records a little bit. Um, a transparent fee structure. This is a big one. We could probably have a webinar on this topic alone. <laughs> um, and that would, and all we would do is go round and round and round about how to explain that to folks. I'm gonna try to summarize it um, into two basic pots. Um, some folks charge, some financial advisors charge a fee for service. Others work in a system where when you buy programs or services through them, they actually get paid by the company that they place your money with. So they buy, you know, a, put your money in a 403B and that happens to be invested with security benefit. Security benefit is going to build into the structure of that program a little bit of money back to that financial advisor in order to make that worth his while or her while. So hey, that's- Teresa? Yes. So one of the questions was you talked about a clean record. How do people, uh, there's a question in the chat about how do you look into people's records? That's a great question, Glenn. Thanks for bringing it up. Um, I put the, the link here on top of this page again. I can't remember if we're gonna send these pages out or not, but when you go to our website and you get logged in, you can just enter in the search engine, financial advisor, choosing a financial advisor, anything like, and these articles are gonna pop up so you'll be able to find them. And in this particular article, it actually gives you the links to two or three different agencies that track the record, that have a record of the individual financial advisor. So you can see it, it's mostly online, you can find it real fast, and the links are in that article. And I see Kurt did put one of them into the chat. So if anybody that's interested, you can see there's one there that Kurt just put. Great, thank you. So back to the fees. So you've got fee for service or you've got commission. I'm just gonna call it commission based, even though it's a little more complicated than that. Um, I think the number one thing about point number three here is it needs to be transparent. When Kurt and I, who's going to speak here in a few minutes, first met and started talking about uh, fees and how he works with our members and other school employees and so forth, 
he talked about the fact that he sits down with a person, does this financial review, figures out what they need and what they want and how long it's gonna take and what kind of programs or services they might need to purchase. And he actually runs a comparison on his fee for service versus what he would get paid if he just got paid from the company in which you were investing your money and kind of runs that out to say, when does that break even? And by doing that, you as the member and you as the purchaser, you know, the consumer here, you've got full understanding of what it's going to cost you. And you understand which one of these two routes is the best for you to go. Personally, that's probably the best explanation I've heard from anybody in a long time about fees is let's look at the different options, run the numbers for the period of time that you think you're going to need help based on what you think you're going to need help with, and you can choose for yourself which way you'd like to pay your financial advisor to do that work for you. So ask a lot of questions about that, really understand it. I don't ever want somebody to feel like they've been sold something or that something costs them way more than they understood it to be. That's probably the worst service that we could provide anybody. So just try to get the best understanding that you can of how those fees work. In addition to the fees, having a clean record, working with people like you, um, if they've got some additional training or designations or appointments, um, anything that sort of sets them apart that you like, um, those are good things to know about a financial advisor. And last and certainly not least are the references. I am sure that um, anybody that we have appointed through the NEA retirement program as one of our specialists could probably give a member hundreds and hundreds of references that are teachers or school employees that look and feel and act a whole lot just like you. And I think that that gets right back to number one where it says, you know, pick somebody who works with people like you and that others trust and understand. So there's lots of ways to go about it. Those are kind of the basic things that I would keep in mind um, as you went about trying to choose an, a, a financial advisor. Again, and I, I, can't, I can't say this enough, there isn't one guy, and I use that male, female, so sorry if that's offensive, but there is not one person who is the best person for everybody. Everybody has their own needs and their own unique situation. You just need to you know, interview and talk to a handful of them and find the one that you feel best about. So with that, I am gonna just wrap up here with a quick reminder of going to neamb.com backslash start and clicking around on that webpage and finding yourself all kinds of resources, all kinds of information about retirement planning. And our hope at NEA and um, with the help of NEA Alaska is that our website and this webinar and your access to me and to Kurt and others as we move forward will give you a good foundation to start taking control of your retirement journey. Thank you, Teresa. That's, that's fantastic. And uh, we did get a couple questions. We got one question for you out of the chat. And I appreciate Glenn Bafia, our executive director, jumping that one in there for you. Um, and please, if you have more questions, feel free to type them into the chat. We'll try to get them to Teresa or our next uh, presenter, Kurt, here. Um, or raise your hand and we have questions at the end, or you can email about them. Those are all different options for you. Um, all right, our next, our next presenter, Kurt, Kurt Witzleben, is from Anchorage. So he's an Alaskan. In fact, he was born and raised in Alaska. Um, and he owns his own financial advisor firm in Anchorage. Um, he went to Tudor Elementary. I know if you're an Anchorage person, you know, that will be important. He went to Wendler and he graduated from East High School, class of 94. Um, and he said that 40% of his clients are educators and that he takes a lot of pride in helping them become educated. He, he sees himself, his role as an educator also, and he's trying to help us as educators understand what we need to do uh, to save for our own financial future so we can have something secure. Because like I said at the, the beginning, if you're in that defined contribution, tier three tours, tier four per side, you really have to take control of, your, uh, of what you're doing. It's uh, a good idea if you're one of the other people in the other tiers to do that. But if you're in the, in the defined contribution area, you absolutely have to. And so not that you have to use a financial advisor, but you have to take control of it in some way. Um, and actually, I found out one other fun fact about Kurt 
uh, after he jumped off the call and we were talking the other day, somebody told me, Kurt, you got to tell me if you're, if this is right or not, but did your grandfather really sign the Alaska constitution? Cause if he did, that's some pretty good sourdough status, uh, street cred you got there. So take it away, Kurt. <laughs> yeah, he did. Um, my, um, on my side, my mom's side of the family, I'm fourth generation Alaskan. Um, my grandfather was born on Douglas Island in Juneau. Um, and worked his way up to Fairbanks. Um, and then during the constitutional delegation, he was one of the delegates um, who helped draft the Constitution and signed it. And uh, his copy of the Constitution hangs in my office. So um, that's, that's a great way to start. I love that intro. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, he, it, the, you always look back and you think about how tough those Alaskans were compared to how sissy we are these days. Um, hearing the stories about what they did throughout their lives. And um, he never got a college education, but he was one of the delegates that helped draft um, the constitution for this state. So it takes all kinds. So um, thank you, Tim, for the introduction. Um, I'll go ahead and pull my slides up here really quick. Um, let's see here. Share. And slideshow, there we go. Uh, so let me introduce myself. My name is again, Kurt Witzleben. Uh, I'm a financial advisor here in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, I've been doing this now for almost 19 years as a financial advisor. And that entire 19 years, I have been working with um, educators in the 403B platforms uh, across the state. Um, I've got clients from one end of the state to the other, uh, rural and urban Alaska. So there's a lot of um, experience I have in that 403B market. Uh, but with that also comes the knowledge of the TERS and PERS program. Uh, and part of what I'm going to talk about today is just the, the options you have for retirement. Uh, like Tim said, my, my first and foremost responsibility, I think, for my clients is to um, educate you. Because this is, at the end of the day, this is your money. Uh, how you use it in retirement uh, is to, to your benefit. And my job is to help get you there on that. But I also... And not want to come in and just pat you on the head and tell you it's okay, I'll take care of it for you. Um, you have to take responsibility because it's your money. Uh, I think it's kind of the, the general concept of this overall call is to empower you with, with the knowledge to you know, make the retirement what you can. Uh, so the agenda today, uh, we're going to go over some of your options for retirement, why, why those options are important to you, why it matters, and, and how you uh, can take the action because at the end of the day, you're the one who has to go, this is important to me, I'm going to do it. Um, no one's going to come in kicking and screaming. Uh, Teresa made comment about the people that show up in your, your lounges. Uh, my mom's a retired school teacher. She taught special ed for 27 years in Anchorage. Um, and she referred to those uh, folks as lounge lizards and uh, told me that if I'm going to be a financial advisor, I can never go to the lounge. So you'll never find me in the lounge. Um, on that note, um, your options for retirement. Uh, real quick rehash of Social Security. Uh, Alaskan um, PERS and PERS, for the most part, do not pay into Social Security. Uh, that's the, based on the portion that you would pay into Social Security uh, in other employment gets paid into the state retirement program. Uh, keep in mind that with the Social Security, even if you do work, another job and most school teachers do for at least part of all their career work other employment uh if you look at the second section here uh your different employment you'll receive a reduced benefit the sad fact is is as much as you may work another job because you have uh, TERS and PERS as your primary you will receive reduced benefit from social security so you have to prepare and plan for that same thing with the spousal employment um, you can claim benefits, but it's a reduced benefit. Again, because you have that um, TERS or PERS option that you know pays your that that pays you that monthly income. Uh, the windfall elimination provision, um, I I don't I don't care for. It's uh, one of those things again where you don't pay into the system, and in order to get your benefit, if you read there, 30 years of substantial earnings in other employment holding a full-time second job. You're a school teacher. You, by definition, that's two full-time jobs. You have a day job with the kids, and then the night job, getting ready for the next day. So um, my mom, for example, taught 
the 27 years, but also worked in the family business um, and worked her way through college and she had all those earnings, but because of the windfall el elimination provision, she only gets 40% of her social security benefit um, that she's owed. Um, government pension offset, same thing. It can reduce your pension by two thirds. Uh, not reduce your pension, reduce your social security payout by two thirds. So that's something where, again, you hope for that guarantee, you hope for that income in retirement, um, but you're gonna get knocked down for that because what you have deters and purrs. Um, the state control, um, purrs and deters, defined contribution plan. Like Tim has talked about, she's talked about in July 1st of 2006, the uh, retirement world changed for a lot of new people. Tiers one and two, have a pension plan, it's defined benefit where you work your certain number of years, times the formula they've got, and that is a compensation you'll receive on a monthly basis from now till you pass away, uh, which is a nice baseline of income. Um, but those of you who are in defined contribution plans, it's very much like a, a forced 401k. Your money comes out that you would have paid into Social Security, um, it pays into the PERS and TERS program, which is managed by Empower. And when you retire, that pot of money is a pot of money that you live off of in retirement. Uh, the risk on that is you can outlive it. If you take too much early on um, or it doesn't perform well, uh, you, worst case scenario, could be left with no retirement savings. If that's all that you end up doing is what PERS and TERS lays out for you. Uh, and other things here is the workers receive less benefits. Everyone's heard tier one, tier two Cadillac plans, uh, wonderful benefits. And it's true in comparison to what the later um, employees of the state retirement program get, it's, it's not as good, uh, which then puts it into, you have to make the control decisions as to what you want in retirement and how you're going to get there. So those of you who are part of the defined contribution plan have to take more action um, to get the retirement that you've envisioned for yourself. Now, the, the PERS, there's two slides here. One's for PERS and one's for TERS. Um, again, it's for permanent full-time employees in the state of Alaska, um, and that's 30 hours or school district lingo, uh, at least working a 0.8 to be a considered full-time employee, earning those credits for, uh, for your retirement. Of course, elected officials are part of that and other state officials as well, but they're not part of our call, so we'll skip over that part. Um, TERS. TERS I'm very familiar with. Um, this is for the full-time and part-time teachers, basically the certified teachers. You're certified to teach in your position um, versus classified, which is PERS. Um, the, the UAA is also involved in that. The big thing to look at here and this is a conversation that I have uh, regularly when working with uh, school employees, is you'll hear the, you hear the um, mantra, oh, you have to save 15% of your income if you want to have the retirement that you plan for. Well, if you look here for TERS uh, 3, 8% is mandatory comes out of yours, 7% is mandatory comes out of the employer, there's your 15%. Unfortunately, that, that statistic that the investment world puts out there is you're electing to put 15% of your income away because that 15% is essentially what they assume Social Security is going to pay you. So for those people who, have, you know, you have so much going on as educators, um, that retirement is kind of one of those things that you push off. It's, it's like the mechanic is the last one who fixes their own car. Um, this is important for your years after you've worked. Um, and you hear these, you hear, you hear one set, one statistic saying, oh, well, you say 15%. You see that and go, great, 15%, cover. Unfortunately, that 15% was already accounted for in that in investment world for your social security benefit or a pension benefit. So that's just the baseline for you to live off of. Um, and we can, and, and feel free, if you have questions, throw them up there. I'll try and keep track of that and, and circle back around and answer those. Again, uh, educating is what I hope to do here. The defined contribution plan. Um, 
the important things to realize here is this is an investment and that if you if you have other investments and you've seen the past two months it's gotten it's it's gotten pretty beat up um versus if you're a tier one or tier two doesn't matter you have your years of service you know times the formula and off you go um this one here the important factor is you don't have control over defined contribution earnings because they're part of the overall investment pool they can go up and down and you can't control inflation or the unexpected expenses. Inflation is my number one enemy as a financial advisor. I want to maintain buying power. I want that, that $10,000 today to buy at least $10,000 worth of goods 10 years from now. And right now that's easy. Inflation is 2.3% the past two or three years. But if you look back to what inflation was, say, in 1990, it was five and a half percent. These things are going to fluctuate. And so my job as an advisor is to help maintain and try and combat things like inflation. Unex unexpected expenses could be uncovered medical expenses. So these are, these are things that can kind of screw up a nest egg if you don't properly plan for it along the way. So what do you do? There's two things here. One, the areas you can't control. The state defined contribution plan. Mandatory contributions go into that. It's invested through the way that, that Empower does that and there are some options for that. But then on the, what you can control is what you have in your own personal savings, your, your supplemental options as they're thrown out there. And I think the number one supplemental option that is put out there to school teachers is the 403B programs available through pretty much all the school districts in the state. Uh, there are also some districts have Roth 403Bs, Roth 457s and 47 plans and a whole bunch of alphabet soup essentially of what you can do for retirement. Um, there's individual IRAs and also other savings. One of the things that's not put in here that I make an important part of the overall financial planning um, sit down when we get together is, is debt reduction or debt control. Uh, it's hard to retire if you still have a mortgage on the house. It's hard to retire and have the retirement you want if you still have the student loans in place. Um, so that's something that we talk about on the side as part of the overall planning procedure. But for the supplemental savings, um, the 403B is probably your number one option through the employer. There's, in some districts, and, and this is where like Tim talks about, it's diff districts run in different ways. Some districts, Almost all districts have a traditional 403B. Some of them also offer a Roth 403B. Um, Fairbanks North Star is the only one in the state that I know of that is a 1% match for their 403B plan, which is awesome. Um, some districts like Matsu offers the 457 plan. So there's a whole bunch of different investment options that are out there for you. And how you determine what's gonna be the best fit for you is you hear pre-tax, which also is referred to as traditional savings. The money goes in um, pre-tax for your paycheck, so it reduces your taxable income. Fast forward to retirement, when you pull that money out in retirement, um, you're taxed at that point in time. Roth or after tax, when your paycheck is, is being distributed, the Roth investments are taken out after the after tax has been collected. They go into a 403B, a Roth 403B, and they grow tax deferred, just like the traditional 403B. And then in retirement, the big difference is, is if you've met the requirements of having a, a Roth account open for at least five years and being over the age of 59 and a half, all the earnings come out tax-free, as does the principal. So you can have your, your, your defined contribution plan from the state, which is all pre-tax, feeding some of your income, and then having some of that Roth 403B, if it's available through your district, giving you tax-free income to help balance you out to look poor to the to Uncle Sam. So that those are those are conversations that are individual. Everyone's situation is a little bit different. Um, and oops, I apologize, I hit the wrong button here. Sorry, sorry about that. To kind of show you how 
that works. And I'm going to skip past this slide because it has the same information on the second slide here of, to, to give you an illustration of what I mean. Is if, in this example, your paycheck's $1,000. Um, and we have, you know, after tax, again, Roth, this is the first column here. You have uh, $240 taken out for taxes. Your take home pay is 760. You make a Roth deposit of $100 into your account. So your net take home is $660. So that money fast forward into retirement, that's the tax free money. Now pre-tax is your traditional 403B. And the difference here is when the 403B is taken from the paycheck. In this case, there's your $1,000 earnings. Subtract out $100, it goes into your 403B. So your taxable income is only $900 as opposed to that $1,000. It's taxed at the 24%, so it's $216. Um, so filter on down to the bottom. The overall tax savings for pre-tax is about $24. So uh, again, it's, it's figuring out what's gonna fit for you to determine which is the better option. For some folks who you know, have a spouse that makes a lot of money and taxes are an issue, pre-tax may be the way to go. For those who wanna have tax-free money in retirement, then Roth may be the way to go. But it's also dependent on what you have available to your district. Kurt, there's a question. Um, what is the main difference between a 457 and a 403B? Oh, that's a, that's a good financial geek question right there. Um, so the, the main difference is the 403B, which is just a title that comes from the tax code, um, was for nonprofits, school districts, and hospitals. And um, it's kind of the nonprofit's version of a 401K. The rules that apply to those is you have to be 59 and a half years old to take qualified distributions without 10% tax penalty. And the 457 is was designed for small governments. Um, and and the, the difference there comes in the fact that there's no 59 and a half year old qualification to withdraw your money. So let's say, and, and the reason that was designed was within municipalities, um, you may have firefighters and police officers, which don't typically work to 60 years old or 59 and a half years old. So when they retire, they need to have access to their retirement dollars. So, they didn't include that 59 and a half. It's just as soon as you sever service with that employer. So take, for example, if you had a 47 through Math Sioux and you were funding that and decided to retire at the age of 53, you can start drawing income off of that, four, that 457 and not have the 10% penalty for early withdrawal that you would have for a 403B. Um, and, and the cool tax structure, again, that's a little geek statement, I realized as I said that, was that you're able to, if you have a 403B and a 457 within the same employer, you can contribute the maximum to both. So if you really want to accelerate your savings and you've got both available, you can tackle both. So the big difference between the 457 and the 403B is the age at which you can start withdrawing those funds without any penalty other than whatever your tax bracket happens to be. So. Thank you. And do, does, do you know if every school district has a 457? No, they don't. Um, Matsu has it. Uh, Fairbanks does not. Anchorage does not. Um, Kenai does, as far as I recall. Yes, Kenai, Kenai Penn does. Um, and I'm not sure about the, the districts in Southeast. But most of the rural, I don't, I don't know of any of the rural districts that have 457 plans. I think most of all of them are all just 403 plans. Um, now, what, why it matters. If you look at the stats here, they come from Gallup. Um, the average U.S. worker retires at age of 61. And from my own personal experience with my, my employees, my clientele, um, that's right in this the sweet spot of when a lot of my clients retire is in, this, is in their early 60s. Um, the reason it's important is you look over on the right, how long you're gonna live. Now, if you took these stats from 20 or even 30 years ago, we weren't living nearly as long. The wonders of modern medicine and science are keeping us along and alive and kicking a lot more effectively now than we would have earlier. So 
we have a much longer window to have to fund retirement than we did many moons ago. And so, I mean, you're feasibly looking at, you have to be, you know, you have to have enough income in retirement to last you 30 to 40 years if you live to the outer stretches of 100 years old, which for a lot of folks, you know, honestly, a lot of my clients are like, ah, I'm not gonna live to 100. I've got many clients in their late 80s that probably would have told you they'd never make it there. So um, the retirement plan is important because you're having to plan for the future you do the stuff in retirement that you want to do. Kurt, another question about uh, the 457 and 403Bs. Can people yes. uh, withdraw money from either of those before they actually retire if they're of the right age? Yes, if you're of the right age, it's called a, um, a distributable event. So if you are over the age of 59 and a half and you are still working, you are able to withdraw funds from your 403B. The 457, you have to sever service with first, to the best of my knowledge. Um, I've never had a client pull money from a 457 while they've been working in over 60. So I, I'm assuming that based on their rule, you have to be severed from service before the seven plan. Um, but I can double check on that one. Uh, there, they, there is, um, and this comes up a fair amount, and this, actually this question has come up probably twice in the past month from uh, folks who are like, can I, I'm still working with the district, can I pull money from my account to cover bills? And unfortunately, the way the 403B rules were restructured in 2008, um, a hardship withdrawal is a tremendously difficult thing to draw money from. Some 403B plans do offer loans. Um, I'm not generally a giant fan of those because the um, chance of default on a 403B loan is close to 50%. People will take the money out, not think about it. They're like, ah, it's my money. Well, unfortunately, about 25% of that belongs to Uncle Sam if you don't repay that loan. So, and those are situations that come along the way that I chat with clients about. And some districts don't even allow loans. Um, most of them in Alaska, however, they do. So, the retirement expenses, and, and this isn't, I hope this is not trying to put fear in anybody, but just this is the realization. If you think back to what a car cost 20 years ago, as opposed to what the average cost of a car is today, um, again, look at the studies. A $36,000 car uh, is the average cost of a vehicle today. Based on general inflation, as in we've seen the past 20 years, 20 years from now, you got to buy another car, it could be 70 grand. Um, and let's not talk about a Lexus or a Cadillac. This is a Toyota Camry, potentially. Um, your medical costs. Medical costs, especially in Alaska, um, are, growing at much, are growing at a faster rate than the national average right now. Um, your, cost of, your cost of medical care uh, is continuing to creep up. And so these are expenses that you need to prepare for by having, you know, uh, sufficient savings in retirement to cover these costs so that you can live the retirement that you've envisioned for yourself. Um, I've got clients that run the gamut from retired and they, they do their, their gardening in the summer and their quilting in the winter and, you know, go on one trip a year. I've got clients who have two airplanes and a boat. Um, and I can only imagine that the fuel on that kind of stuff is more than the first person spends in a year. So it, what, your, what your retirement plans are is a big factor in how we save for retirement. Um, and that is more kind of an individual thing. At this chart here, or this, this slide here, how much do I need to save? This is, this is a general baseline that I, that I work with when I'm talking to people about saving for retirement. If you do nothing that it just put the, the turs or purrs, that the little blue lines that are poking up there from 60 to 62 to 67 are going to stay roughly the same. But your cost of living, the things you want to do in retirement, the RV you want to buy, um, the new roof here and put in the cabin, those cost extra. And so we need to cover that gap between those little blue lines and that dotted dashing line that goes up. And it goes up because of inflation. So we have to continue to 
even in retirement, those assets still continue have to have to perform along the way. The this slide here basically kind of elaborates on that. What fills the gap? What fills the gap here is going to be the 403Bs, the IRAs, the other investments that you built for yourself along the way on all your working years to cover you in your retired years. Um, I've got some clients who use real estate, rental properties to help cover that gap. Um, but the bulk of my clientele do have um, retirement accounts besides TERS and PERS to cover those responsibilities um, to, you know, for, for retirement income and living. And Kurt, can they uh, contribute more than 8% already contributed to their 403B to max out the IRS account limits? Oh, um, good question. That, um, that 8% does not go into uh, the 403B. That goes into your PERS and TERS. The amounts, there, there's a slide coming up here in just a minute, I'll show you. That's going to show what the contribution limits are to 403B. They've gone up this year. Um, so I'll jump on that here, uh, Glenn, when we get that slide. That's just around the corner here. Thanks. And then there's one more question. Are you yes. um, able to talk about like what the what you think are the best investment options uh, given today's market right now? Well, I, I mean, to an extent, I am, but I, I don't generally I don't give out general advice because again, everyone's situation is a little different. I mean, I looked at the I looked at the video feed when I was when we were getting started here, there's a lot of young people and there's also a lot of older people who are close to retirement. So to throw out a general investment idea right now might work for one group and might not be great for another. Um, and, and that's not trying to dodge the question, but um, like was said earlier, Teresa said, your the person, the, the teacher in the room next door may be the same age of you, but your retirement goals and your retirement timeframes may be completely different, which do change how how you plan for retirement. So um, in today's market right now, it's kind of hold on, <laughs> brace yourself, um, as bad as that is to say, but there's a lot of uncertainty going on right now. Um, and so for a recommendation on, on the short term of today, I, I couldn't, because um, I'm, I'm a long-term planner. Uh, when you think of retirement, you're 20, 30, 40 years out on some of your planning. So. Sorry to be vague on that one. No, that's um, that's um, what I thought you were going to say because that's what we've been telling people that talk to us um, all the time about it. Depends on the person. So, yeah, it, it's it. You'd be surprised how different one person is the next, and even even comfort level on investments is different. Um, how much can I say? This is a basically an example of time. The the earlier you start saving, of course. Uh, the more time frame you have to benefit because time and time and investments is your friend. When I say 20 and 30 years out for retirement, um, we're going to have times like this where the market's down 20 some percent right now. Um, then you look at 2018, the market was up 27%. Uh, you've got these big fluctuations and we have to balance those out. Um, and so this slide basically shows if you begin saving at ages 25 to 55 at hundred dollars a paycheck, um, that's what you can see potential growth along the way. And I think that's assuming, I apologize, it's assuming a 6% rate of return over that compound over time. Um, one note in here, uh, the reality of, of using your financial advisor, I would never have someone save just $100 a paycheck for the next 30 years. Um, with my clients, what I generally do is every year we meet and do a review. Um, I try and get them to increase at least $50 of payroll if they can. Um, not because I'm looking to make a king's ransom off of that, because I don't, but my, my job is to help you save for retirement. And if we can incrementally increase how much you're putting away over time, um, the numbers you see on the screen become a lot bigger, a lot faster by the amount that you put away. And so I have slowly, with all of my clients, crept them up higher and higher in what they can put away because um, again, retirement is basically on them in a lot of cases. So when you talk about the limits earlier, Gwen, um, with that question is you've got the options of the 403B, the 457, the IRA, um, and, and these limits are true whether it's Roth or it's traditional. 
Um, the basic limit, if you're under the age of 50, you know, the 403B, you can put in $19,500 a year. Um, over 50 is a catch up. You can do an additional $6,500, being a total of 26 grand. Um, the 457 is the same limits. Um, and then if you contribute to a 403B and you don't have a 457 and you still have more money you want to put away in retirement, you still have an additional 7,000 you can put away through um, an IRA, an individual retirement account, which is not tied to the school district anyway. Um, and the tax potential savings on the right hand side is basically showing if it was all three tax. Um, that would be your taxable savings per year that you're putting the maximum amount away. Um, but I do work to help people increase how much they put away to get closer to that limit. And you think, whew, $26,000, that's a lot of money. Well, if it's taking me 10 or 15 years to get you to maxing that out and it bumps up a little bit, you're so used to that in your budget, it doesn't affect you that much. Um, but, in, but in all reality, most of my, most of my um, teaching clientele do not hit the, the maximum contribution. Very few of them do. Um, and that's okay. Uh, the, the important thing is they're saving something additional for retirement. Now, how to take action. Right now, I can't imagine how difficult it is to be an educator in the current situation. My wife is an absolute saint right now because she's homeschooling a kindergartner, a first grader, and a second grader um, because of the school shutdown. Um, and I think about that on the scale of that's three kids. Imagine if you had 30 in your classroom, what that turns into. You have a lot going on. And especially as turbulent as your world is right now, if the schedule is being kind of mixed up, um, you'll find every reason to put off making a uh, appointment or making a schedule time to, to talk to a financial advisor to look at your own personal stuff. Um, teachers will all say, oh, I'll take care of that in the summertime. Honestly, in the summertime comes, the last thing you're going to want to do is sit down with a financial advisor and talk after you've had a busy school year. You just want to go do summer stuff. Take the time to talk to a financial advisor to learn about your options. Um, I pride myself on uh, the initial meeting of sitting down and talking with people is explaining the benefits available to you, giving you that education, letting you go home and think about what's the next step, what do I want to do next. Um, and, you know, and that kind of breaks down, you know, early in your career. Those, those who are just starting in teaching, um, I know you probably have student loan debt, you probably have other expenses, but again, the earlier we can start, the better off we are, and you look at all the things that, oh, I can't save for retirement. Oh, I've got tuition, I've got finance, I've got loans, everything I've got to take care of. Um, you can save for, you can, you can get credit for a lot of things. People will loan you money for a lot of things. No one will loan you money for retirement. Um, that one's completely on you. Um, we, may, we make it easy with the payroll deferrals. Uh, just we, in most cases, it's a one page form for salary reduction that goes into the payroll office or the third party administrator. And that automatic is coming out of your paycheck. You don't even see it. You're not having to physically write the check and send it off. Um, most folks don't do that anyway, anymore anyway, but um, it, it's, it's easy early on to start with a low dollar amount in your early career and, and build from there. Those of you who are mid-career, who may have worked in other districts or other states, you know, salary changes, um, getting a good grapple, learning kind of what your defined contribution plan's all about, the different benefits available, because um, you want to determine you should never come to a financial advisor six months before you retire and go, okay, I'm ready. Because there's a lot of steps we may have more. That are, you know, you want to start earlier. Um, a bottom line here, the bottom point here is adjusting your risk portfolio. Young people, we can be more aggressive. We can get our teeth kicked in right now in the retire in, in, in investments in the stock market that's down 20 some percent. That's fine for us young people. But for someone who's a year, two, three years out from retirement, you can't stomach a 20% loss. That changes the whole dynamic of retirement. Um, so as you get closer to that retirement time frame, how aggressively invested you are, what the things you're invested in change. 
And part of that is helping, you know, part of my job is to help you stair step towards that, um, taking that risk profile down a little bit. And that's what this slide's about, is just balancing risk. The allocation of the investments. You know, the younger you are, the more aggressive you can be. The older you get, the more conservative we want to be because we need those assets there when we get retirement time. Uh, and then late career. One thing I tell all of my all of my state employee or state retirement folks to do is you have to start talking with hers and ters to understand your benefits before you're going to retire. You know, what benefit do you take for if you have a spouse? Um, the long-term care option. That's one option that's only available at retirement time, not the day after. You can't take it before. Um, do you need the long-term care option for retirement? I mean, these are things you want to learn about to know what your paycheck's going to look like when it comes out. Um, it used to be two or three months out on booking in-person appointments. Uh, now that I've been doing in-person appointments, it's going to be over the phone. But I will tell you, um, I went with my mother-in-law, who's a retired school, uh, school librarian at Huffman. Um, I went with her to her retirement meeting um, at the Atwood Building in Anchorage. Absolutely amazing. They answered every question. And when it came down to if she took all of these benefits, her paycheck or her monthly check was going to be X amount. When her first check showed up, they were off by $37. I mean, so we had a crystal clear idea of what was going on when it comes to PERS and PERS. And I, I point out on that because it is your baseline of your income. What I help you do is save that addition. Um, you know, again, adjusting risk, consider retirement dates. Um, most teachers are planners. So when it comes to retiring, it's not like, eh, yeah, I'm done. Some do, but most don't. Most plan it out for a year or two in advance. And, and, that's, and that's what you have to look at. Um, your post-retirement budget. Your costs change quite a bit in retirement. You think, oh, why don't I do this? I'll do that. There's a lot of things that change. And part of that is having a discussion to figure out what those are. Um, deciding when you take your benefits. Um, 65 years old, that's a big thing for your medical because when you, before 65, the state of insurance, state of Alaska insurance is your primary, and then at 65, it becomes your secondary because Medicare takes over. And you kind of have to understand what that means. Um, age 55, if you retire at age 55, you can take money from the 403B without the penalty if you separate from service, or 59 and a half is the general retirement age, um, and that's traditional IRAs for sure. You can take your social security benefits as early as 62 years old. Um, and a real quick example, my, my mom retired from teaching. She took it at 62 years old because she knew she wasn't going to go back to work ever again. And if you take your benefits early from social security, you have income earning restrictions until you hit the full retirement age. And since she knew that she'd only go in sub every so often, she wasn't going to hit that mark where my dad worked until he was 70, and so he didn't take his benefits until he retired. Um, that just kind of gives you an idea of how, how different each person's gonna be. I mean, that's a married couple, and they have two drastically different plans. Um, and that's partly what our job is to help you navigate that. And then, kind of running down here, the, the, click, the checklist of getting started, you know, is, is again, yeah, reviewing your plan options, um, Go check out PERS and TERS. It, it, it doesn't sound like the most exciting thing, but it's important. It's really important to get taken care of. Um, using an advisor to help you figure out which is the best way to save. Um, I, I don't bite. If you've got questions, call me. I'll answer your questions. Um, start small and start now. Again, you start small, that's, I'm fine with that, but I'm going to continually encourage you to increase because I want you to build a retirement that you can do the things that you want to do with and then review your plans annually. Um, with most of my clients, my teaching clients, I see them annually, but I answer the phone whenever they call. Um, but we like in person as much as we can possibly do. Um, so, because that annual just kind of helps reassure you what's going on, that your advisor's paying attention to what's going on, um, you know, and just helps you plan for the future. Um, tools available to you. Uh, Teresa talked about this. You can play around with the online calculators, the income gap reports, um, paycheck analyzers. I, I've got this stuff as well. Um, an income and, and strategy, or income and spending strategy. That's basically budgeting. Um, what you're going to spend your money on, how you spend your money on, what's important, what's not. Um, 
those are the tools that are available to you. So in summary, never too late to start saving. Um, if you're starting your career, start early. If you're middle of the career, let's get going. And if your last career, let's figure last part, later part of your career, let's make sure you've got everything in place that you need. So um, on that, I'm I'm pretty much done. Again, Kurt, my name is Kurt Witzleben, um, the financial advisor here in Anchorage. Um, due to what's going on with the coronavirus, I'm not doing any in-person meetings, um, but we can do things like Zoom, over the phone, email. Um, I'm available. Kurt, I have a couple questions for you. If you can back, uh, go back a couple slides before your title, the last little title slide. Uh, go, go, keep going, what? keep going, keep going, keep going, jump around there. Keep going, keep going, one more. Yes. Okay, right there. Uh, the question came up, what is the difference between annual and total? Oh, annual basically means this is the limit for people under the age of 50. Um, and then the annual catch up is for those who are over 50 can contribute the additional amount and the total. So this should be total for over 50 years old is what that should, should read. So someone who's over 50 can contribute up to 26,000. Someone who's under 50 can contribute up to 19,500. Okay, and then there's another question. Are people allowed to contribute after tax dollars into their 403B? And then I'll have a follow up when you're done with that. Um, after tax, if there's a Roth 403B available through the employer plan, they, they can do that. Okay, you got the follow up was, was about the Roth, so that's oh, okay. Thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The after tax, and and the important thing also for folks to realize is the four hundred three Bs and the four fifty sevens. Those are only through salary deferral. You can't write a check um, from your personal sharing account and send it to your four hundred three B account. And the date of that paycheck is what's considered the annual time frame. So unlike an IRA where you can contribute up till April fifteenth, the year previous, or mm -hmm. now it's July thirtieth or something like that. Um, to the year previous, employer plans, 401ks, 403bs, and 457s, those contributions that count for that calendar year happen in that calendar year. Okay, and then um, the last question I see for you before we go to segue for our last 15 minutes here, um, who does someone contact to start a 403b? Does it have to be a financial advisor or are there other ways that you can open up a 403b? Well, they're, they're, it depends on the, the district's plan. Like if you, you, if for those of you in the Anchorage School District, your only option is to go through the Empower plan. There's no financial advisor for that. There's a website. Um, the folks that answer the phone are very nice. I'm not going to pick on them. They're very nice. Um, they'll give you the basic information that you can get here. Um, they will not give you investment advice as to how to allocate your money. They're not licensed to do that. Um, in most of the other districts where there are one or more um, providers for the 403B plan, uh, then you would work with a financial advisor because it has to be someone who is securities licensed through the Securities and Exchange Commission to give you advice and guidance on uh, investments in retirement plan. Thank you, Kurt. Tim? Yeah, thanks, thank you. This is Tim again. Uh, and I just want to thank you on behalf of the members here. I Thank you for the great advice and the ability to sort of look through some of the options that you have with, with financial advisors and you know, having somebody who is an Alaskan uh, share some of that and an educator, someone who wants to educate educators. Uh, we definitely appreciate that. So thank you and uh, thank you. look forward to hearing from you more in the future. Um, and we're gonna jump to Segway Grant, our NA Alaska Vice President. Uh, she's out in Bethel, and uh, she has a couple of slides for you. Now, Segway is just like all of you who are in the defined contribution system. She was hired after 2006, and she can do her little intro. She's from Oklahoma originally, uh, but moved up here to Alaska. And uh, so she's in the Empower account. Those of us pre-2006, we don't necessarily have, uh, well, we don't have those same style of accounts, but she's gonna walk you through what it looks like from her lens. And you can ask her questions in the chat or uh, raise your hand if you want and I'll, and I'll buzz you in for her. And uh, she'll tell you about how it works for in the Empower Zone. So Segway, are you ready? Take it away. 
I hear you, but you gotta unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Yes, I'm going to share my screen. Yep. All right. Okay. So um, I am going to share some Empower. Um, I started with the Bitly and that's the easiest way to get to it. And I need to move everybody's picture. Hold on just a second. They're in the wrong place for me to see y'all. Okay, so the first slide, the reason I wanted to put this up here is because the login help um, is really helpful. I've talked to, to a lot of people that don't have their um, account number, they don't know how to get in. And if you just do the login help, you just answer a few questions about yourself, your social security number, your birthday, and you'll be in lickety split. So that's super helpful. And so the idea of, of my presentation is just to help people be a little bit more proactive in looking at their own Empower account. And when you get in, um, it will say what your current account balance is and the percent of your goal. And, um, it's always a little disappointing that the percent of the goal is so low. Um, and there is a, because this is a screenshot, I can't really show you the sliding scale, but if you get into your account, which I really recommend everybody do, you play around. Can you see my um, pointer when I point? Yep, yep, we can see that. Okay, perfect. So when you get in, um, there's different uh, tabs that you can play with. And there is a sliding scale down here that you can also play with. Um, so the, the, this slide is because um, Empower offers webinars and they're really fantastic. Uh, every time I've wanted to talk to someone at Empower, they have either answered my questions right then or called me back within 24 hours. And last week and this week, I, I spoke to the same person in trying to get some more information specifically for this roadshow. Because I have, um, in working with the SOAR people, really tried to be more empowered myself with my own account. I wasn't very um, knowledgeable about what was going on with my own account on a regular basis. But since uh, doing SOAR and trying to get other people to be more uh, proactive I've done that myself and so when I was speaking to the advisor he said you know what the best thing is to tell people to go to these webinars because they're offered every month different times on how to navigate the site uh, the state of Alaska plan overview the difference between the TERS and the PERS and distribution options and it all is free and it is um, provided by Empower Oh, sorry. Um, so this is how you get in. The directions are there, but I also have screenshotted it for you. So if you go to your screen, your, after you sign it, before you sign in, I'm sorry, under plan resources, you can just click on attend a webinar. And when you do that, there's all these webinars that are coming up. The next one is in April this month, and you can just sign up sign up for them like you did the roadshow and they're very short they're 30 minutes each and they kind of give you a chance to do different things and they're repeated throughout the months so if you wanted to see one and catch it again you could go back to it oh dear sorry about that you guys Um, the other thing is you can schedule an appointment and I have actually done this a few times myself and again they're free. You can schedule an appointment with uh, Empower Retirement Plan Advisor. Um, they'll do a retirement readiness review with you and they have different kind of accounts that they can talk, talk you through whether it's managed or not managed, what that means. There are some things that you can pay extra for or not managed. And so uh, again, this is to give you some of that information and to really encourage you to um, talk to their advisors to see what is offered besides just looking at 
your account balance. Um, like once this Corona virus started, I definitely saw a huge dip in my account. And then um, I was working on this presentation yesterday and today and again tonight I looked and my account had gone up significantly in 24 hours and it was just amazing the market really is tied to what our retirement is doing more so than um, the defined uh, benefit people like we really feel it and so looking at these things make a really big difference and so talking to the advisor uh, will help you to see like do it for do it for me Help me do it, do it myself, and what those different things look like and whether they're an extra fee or not. I'm currently, as it says current on there, that's the one I use, I use myself is help me do it. Um, and it's just having that control and understanding what you want to do. And one of the reasons that I, I put this in here is because when we met as a SOAR group um, in person, we shared out some of our screens and it was, um, obvious that we had some different managed accounts or not managed accounts and what mine looked like might have looked different for someone else so rather than to show you mine and it like confuse you because yours doesn't look like that i really really encourage you to look at your own accounts and to contact the advisors to find out what they can do for you um, all right, so here's some strategies and services that the advisors offer. Uh, personalized service, they can help it simplify it for you. Comprehensive and one-to-one. -one. And it is amazing that so many people that I have talked to, because I really am wanting to get a feel of what people are or aren't doing, that they aren't even looking into their account. Okay. So. That's a, good, that's a great yeah. question. I'm going to pause you just there for a second because we decided we were just thinking about this. Why don't we just do a poll of the people on the line right now and find out how many of them have actually accessed their Empower account? Because we've heard reports that uh, at our membership at large that it's been as low as like only 10% of the members have actually logged in. And so we started running the poll. You might see it on your screen. It popped up, says Empower in Progress. And uh, so far the vote, it keeps the vote total there if you keep it on the screen. And right now it looks like we have 14 yeses and six noes as far as people on this call that have actually logged in. So the majority have logged in, but there's some yeah. people who haven't. So it's kind of interesting. It's like a teacher, and you are a teacher obviously, and you get to know your audience. You get to, you're so Tim, you're seeing, you're seeing the results. I don't know if everybody can see the results because oh, okay. I cannot. Oh, so this is my first time trying the poll thing, and Zach was going to run it for us. So I'm just telling you the results, I guess, and everyone must be voting. Uh, but I get to see the results slowly increase. And it's, uh, like I said, it's 16 yeses and six noes so far of the people who voted. So there you go, Segway. And, and Segway, there's, there's one other. Oh. I'm just saying, Segway, there's one other question. Um, somebody was asking if you can go back to the appointment website link so they can see that real quick. Sure. Um, and you might be able to see the polls. It's at the top of the screen. It's a pull down. It was on mine. Okay. Um, there you go. Well, I think it's one more back. And it's not. Oh. Two more. One more. The one that had the, all the different uh, times and possible things you could go to. That thing, yes. I the webinar that. website is different than the. Which one did you want, Glenn? Um, let me look. The appointment website link. Yep, there it is. Stateofalaska.empowermytime.com, and it's not case sensitive, so it could all be lowercase. It's just easier to read this way. Right there. That's what we wanted. Thank you. Uh, and they do typically have an office in Anchorage and they meet in person, but because of what's happening right now, they're only doing a phone or video meetings with people. Uh, but they, and if you go to this particular website, there's a list of people that you can choose from. And if you have someone that you want to work with regularly, you can book the same person, or you can choose to do it based on availability. So now that I have been talking to the same person multiple times, that's who I, I is my go-to at the moment. 
All right, I just shared the results of the poll because it said the poll ended. I guess there was a time limit on it. So hopefully you get to see those. I'm not sure how they pop up on everyone's screen, but 21 people said they had access their Empower account and eight said they hadn't and one person said don't know. So there you go, there's your results. Fabulous. And really, again, if you have not done it and you're afraid that you don't know where your statement is, it does not matter. If you know your birthday and you know your social security number, and your name, you can get into your account. It's super easy. And I know that because I have to do that regularly because I write down my password in a secret special spot that I never have with me when I want to look into it. So I take advantage of that quite frequently. Okay. Um, and the other website I really wanted to uh, show you is also an Empower a website. It's called Wellness and Financial Center. And this particular website, Me and My Money, it has different links connected to spending, saving, investing, and protecting. And underneath there, those links are mostly articles. There are some calculators and things like that, but they're just little, quick little articles that have to do with each of those topics. And I am trying to be really proactive and, and do something every week to learn a little bit more for my own benefit. So I think that brings me to the end of mine. Do you guys have any questions? Just don't be afraid of it. Yeah, no, that's great advice, Segway. And, and people have been typing a few things in there. You know, the one that came up earlier that's hard to answer, and I, I gave the best answer I could, it has to do with retirement, uh, healthcare, uh, you know, before you get to Medicare. And we've talked about that as a SOAR committee before. There's not a great answer. And I couldn't remember the exact percentage that's put away for everyone, but there is a, a very small percentage. And we've been trying to get the Department of Retirement and Benefits to display that on your, on, on your site. So when you go to Empower, you can see how much each individual person has to use in that account. Um, but they haven't been able to do it yet. And uh, we have a couple people on SOAR who are very interested in seeing that displayed. And it hasn't um, come up yet. I'm not sure if the raise hand function is, is working, but uh, I know people are typing questions in the chat, which I appreciate. Uh, the, uh, you know, this has been a really fun kind of uh, experience to sit here and, and uh, go through this. This was the first, you guys were all the, uh, the first people that we have uh, gone through this particular um, uh, experience with. Uh, the, uh, you know, it's a, it's a fun sort of way to, to find out what's going on. Um, I want to put the SOAR committee up there one more time for you so you can see the people that are on that. Uh, that would be, of course, Segway, who just spoke to you, and uh, the people from around the state. Oops, I just bumped back to the last slide on that, didn't it? There it is. And also, I want to uh, put up the emails for Glenn, who's been handling our questions. Thank you, Glenn and Matt, who are both available if you have follow-up questions you want to get a hold of us. You know, these people who are in your regions, you can also get a hold of them. They're actual educators. Uh, some are teachers, some are ESPs, and uh, they, they are available, too, for you to uh, reach out to if you want to uh, contact them because they, they happen to live where you live. Tim, so, one, final, one final question. Do you know if um, educators have access to health savings accounts? Yeah, that's the one I just was sort of making reference to to segue. And the answer is if you have worked the, uh, the five years in defined contribution and you're vested, you start to gain some percentage and there's a calculation. And so the answer is yes, but it's a, it's a small number. And the state has been very reluctant to display that properly. And we're still working on trying to get that displayed properly. So uh, apparently you can call them up and if you badger them a lot online, the person you talk to will eventually tell you your number, but uh, it really should be displayed so everyone can add that into their calculus. The person who asked the question on the chat earlier uh, was intending to retire uh, age 60 and were after working 30 years and, and that would put them at least five years away from getting to Medicare and they wanted to cover that time period and they wanted to know how much money they had. It's a, it's a perfectly legitimate question and one that we're, the SOAR committee is, com is committed to getting an answer. And Tim, if they contact Empower, can they get the medical information stuff? Will the Empower person be able to say, if you want to retire at this certain age, you have to work this many years, that kind of thing? I don't think they get 
quite that uh, detailed as far as telling you how many years you need to work to get there. What they should be able to tell you is how much you have in your health retirement account that's supposed to be able to help you cover the gap between uh, to pay premiums before you actually reach Medicare age. They should be able to tell you that precise number. And, and you should be able to then use that number to decide how many years prior to Medicare age you might consider retiring, knowing that you have to pay potentially pay premiums during that time. And Tim, I, w I would just like to say when I had that conversation, it was not with the empower person when it came to the health, it was with the state of Alaska. It was a different information. It was a different contact. Okay, good. It's probably Department of Retirement and Benefits. You're right. Sorry. Yeah. Empower is a company. It's a na national company. It was hired by the Department of Retirement and Benefits in Alaska to manage uh, these accounts. And they do that part. And so when you invest your money, you have to that's seven and eight percent that you have going into those if you're a tourist person that goes to empower and then what segway showed you is sort of how empower will let you invest it um we of course encourage you to invest more than that um and that's where kurt comes in or other financial advisors come in to help you if you're not sure how to do that or you invest in a 403b on your own in some other way but you really have to make sure you have enough money because no one else is looking out for you or your best interests and if you want to retire and don't, you don't want to work until you're 92 or whatever that slide is that Kurt showed us. You need to make sure that you have enough money actually saved in some accounts. And you don't want to run out when you're old. I mean, it's just that that's one of the things that's made makes this uh, particular uh, particularly challenging problem for our educators in Alaska because there's no other state that has the same set of issues that we do. No social so, security and, and that. So Tim, I'm gonna, it's 6.30, so I know we wanna stop and people can uh, send us other questions beyond us, but there are two in the chat that I just wanna get answered and then we're gonna say goodbye. If people have more questions, they can contact me or Matt. Um, what happens to your health money if you're still working at 65? Do you know that, Tim? I do not know the answer to that one. It's a great question, I'll write it down. We'll try to get you an answer, Steve, sorry. Okay, and do people have to pay extra into a health retirement account or is that just part of the whole retirement uh, monies yeah. it's on the screen there's a uh, there's a calculations benefits uh, uh, page that that we have and we should probably put on our website and with our retirement things we should probably put that up there it really details precisely what the state pays into all the different accounts because even though we really talk a lot about the seven and eight percent there actually are a few other benefits that are accrued by all educators, um, and uh, and you really got to know all your benefits. And uh, so I apologize that we don't have that precisely right here in front of us. And Tim, do you want to tell everybody about the SOAR newsletters? If they're not signed up, they can get it. And um, maybe the next SOAR newsletter, we can put some of this medical stuff into. I think that's a great idea. So uh, it's really Segway's idea. She had the idea that we do a SOAR newsletter once a month. It comes out right at the beginning of the month. Every single NEA Alaska member is eligible to receive it if you want. You have to opt into it. You can send an email to Glenn or Matt and say, opt me into the SOAR newsletter, and they will get you click, they'll click a little thing on your membership that will automatically make it arrive in your mailbox uh, once a month. And the idea is just to continue to raise this issue and make sure that we're advocating uh, for what's the best interest of our tier three and, and TERS and tier four PERS members. Oh, and there's the sign up there. Oh, you can even go one step faster. Zach would put it up there. There's a quick uh, link to log in and uh, become a subscriber to the SOAR newsletter. Thank you, Zach, that's awesome. So please do click that and become a SOAR uh, subscriber. If you haven't already, that's an NEA Alaska once a month uh, email that comes out and you can share that with your friends, uh, talk to your other colleagues at your school about that. Also, you can see Matt and Glenn have put their emails up there so that you have an opportunity to uh, just grab that and send further questions to them. Uh, with that, uh, this has been great. This is a really interesting first, first try at this. 
Uh, you guys have been great to stick with us this whole time. Thank you again to Kurt and Teresa and Segway for being presenters and Glenn for hosting all those questions for us. We're going to do another one on Thursday and another one on Saturday. So if you have some friends that haven't signed up yet, have them uh, have them contact their local president and if they don't have the link and we'll get them signed up so they can be part of this in the future. Every single TERS 3 and PERS 4 member should do this. So thank you for taking control of your retirement and I wish you the best of luck and be safe.